Okay, so does anybody have any questions before we start? Alright, so, yeah. Uh, I'm still in the process of uh, grading them. I should have them to you uh, by noon tomorrow. Yes. So. Could you give it to us on Wednesday? Well, let me say it instead of just answering questions. Uh, just okay, dumb, but you're on fire today, man. Oh, I just <laughs> Between stealing Mesha's homework and. Yeah, stealing my attention. I'm just going to ask all the questions without you before you have the opportunity to, to tell the class. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, so here's the way that's going to work. After class on Wednesday, I'm going to post it, like direct, actually, I've uh, I'm going to have it so that way it's time, so that way at 1030 it will be available on Blackboard. Um, I'm 95% of the way done writing it. Um, I've actually talked to some of my friends who are at uh, Intel and AMD and asked them for some uh, good ideas on things that they could put on there. Uh, I think it's coming together really well, uh, and I think it will be a good experience for you to kind of work with it. The whole objective of this is for you to, uh, the connection has been lost trying to reconnect. That's great. So anyway, um, the whole goal is for you to kind of work and see like how do you put ideas together. So as engineers, you know, when you're not, uh, you, you if you're going to do the same thing that everybody knows already, you know, that you're, you're going to be a technician. You're going to be troubleshooting and working on stuff. As engineers, you're going to be trying to come up with new things. So eventually at some point you have to demonstrate that you're connecting ideas and trying to put them together and come up with solutions. So, uh, in this case, that's kind of what you're going to be doing. You're make, you know, there's, I want, the thing that I want to see you do on this, on this take home exam is show me your thought process. So I, I have this whole thing on, on there about, you know, you're in this scenario where you're in an interview and somehow the, it's a fanciful scenario where the only thing you have is your TGOs and your textbook and somehow the, you have an internet connection, but it only shows my vid, YouTube video lectures. So just, you know, magical theoretical place, you know, cheating on this is dumb for a couple of reasons. One, you're upper level students. So that tends to be treated with more harshly. Second of all, the whole point is to try to give you this scenario of practicing for a job interview. So really the only person you'd be cheating is yourself. So what I want to see is how are you connecting ideas? What are you putting them together? Are you using your notes? Are you actually seeing like, okay, I understand the underlying physics and that I understand how the underlying physics is turned into switches. And then you have this non you know, ideal scenario. How do I deal with linear and cutoff and saturation? How do I put all these concepts together uh, to be able to solve some problems? And if you're able to do that, then you demonstrate, okay, now I'm thinking at a level just beyond a technician. I'm now thinking at an engineer's level. Right? So that's kind of what is going to be going on. So everything through today is what's going to be covered. That's why I'm 90, say 95% finished because I want to see what we get through today. Uh, we're going to be talking about this concept of Elmore delay. So up to uh, this point, we've talked about uh, our kind of RC representations of circuits, how we're using the, re the natural resistance of the transistor to represent uh, how fast a circuit goes through and it models an RC delay. And it has this general transient response. And we put all, you know, we had these three input NAND gates and these two input NAND gates. And we saw that they kind of added up two, four, six, and this was nine. And then you had uh, three C plus two C. So the input and output was nine C and five C. So we're going to be noticing a pattern here. And we're, and we're using this concept of Elmore delay to be able to represent that. So basically you have this uh, first, order response here. So this is 3.10. Uh, so it, it, it's additive, right? So the number of nodes in I, so you have, each one is going to present an RC circuit here. So the equation that you're using is going to be 
R1C1 plus, so you see how these kind of add up. So the, it's going to add R1 plus C1, so this ties into your propagation delay. is approximately equal to how many resistors you add on here. But it's a simple approximation in that the second unit that you add is R1, R2 plus C2, right? So the reason why you're adding it this way is because when you're, the way capacitance works is it holds and then dissipates, right? Here it holds and then dissipates. And the amount that it's holding is dependent upon the previous resistance. So in your first unit, your resistance, and then it's going to dissipate, right? When you have the second capacitance, it's going to have the second one, and it's going to dissipate C2, which is why it adds this way. Same thing. As you get more and more resistance, that's going to contribute to that specific propagation delay through that capacitor. So that's why they sum in that manner. So if you had the third one, it would be R1, R2. plus R3 times C3. And then as you see at the end, it goes through R1, R2, all the way through R1, plus the last times the last capacitance. And when you sum those together, you get the propagation delay. If it ever decides to actually circle. The computer is filled with flawless victory today. What's going on over there? I'll be right back. Okay, hopefully that fixed it. Okay, it did. Okay, so sample 3.4. So here's a general idea. If you recall this, we had this three input NAND gate, right? And the way we figured this out is that we did our little algorithm, we realized that these didn't contribute, right? And we had 2C, 2C, and 2C, right? And then, so that was 6C, and then you had the capacitance here, and those added together to be 9, right? And then the reason we have 5 here is because we have 3 on the inputs, and two of the inputs here. So this becomes five. So the way this is going to work is if we keep adding inputs, it's going to just keep adding two here because it's always going to go through one and a PMOS transistor. But you're going to keep adding. So this would become four if we added, they would all be four, right? And this would become 2, and this would become 6. And that would make this 10. So what ends up happening is the output capacitance becomes 9 plus 5H, where H is the number of inputs, right? So this is actually a very, 
these are going to become classic equations that you're going to see over and over again. So the rise delay is going to correspond to your capacitance here from VDD to the output. And so you're going to have this resistance. It's going to correspond to 9 plus 5H times the, times the internal capacitance. So 9 plus 5H RC corresponds to your delay. Right? So the question is phrased, estimate the worst case rising and falling delay of three input NAND gates driving H identical NAND gates. So this H corresponds to, let's say if we had four, right, nine plus five H. So this input capacitance is five. So this is driving one input on another NAND gate. So this input is five C. So if you're driving H identical NAND gates, it becomes 9 plus 5 H C and then the path goes so you have an R going through from VDD to the output corresponding to this because remember it's 2 R over K which is 2 in this case so when that cancels out that becomes 9 plus 5 H And so for the falling delay, falling is from ground to the output, right? Because we want to create an instance where it's zero. So in, this, for, in order for this to happen, it has to go through all three NMOS transistors. <laughs> so now we use our Elmore delay equation. So we have R3 times 3C for the first element. So now if it's dissipating through the second capacitor, it has to go through two resistors and 3C. So it's going to be R3 plus R3 times 3C. And then third, we're going to have R3 plus R3, I'm sorry, R over 3 plus R over 3 plus R over 3 times 9 plus 5H over C because we're driving H NAND gates. So this becomes our summation in order to actually have a full pull down because we have to activate all three transistors. So this should actually, the additive element of this should start to make sense. Now, let me, let me ask you a potential exam type question. Why do you think for in each of these cases where other than what I've just described about how the resistance and capacitance is dependent on it, why, do, why would that make sense intuitively in terms of the physical application? Why, is, why are we adding all three resistors here? And both of the resistors there and, but, and just this one here. What's the difference? What is going on as we have, actually, we actually want a zero to get to the output here? What do you think is physically going on here? And why does it make sense that it's additive? Right. Well, why why are we having more resistance? What is the capacitance in a transistor? Think back to section two, where we talked about this a lot. What is going on with the different capacitance? In order for, okay, so what is capacitance? Come on, everybody, wake up. Capacitance is defined as what? Come on, you guys are overthinking this. The capacitance is the ability of a body to hold a unit charge, right? And so in order for the flow 
to get from one transistor to another, right? So let's talk about a scenario in which this, these two transistors are on and this one is off, right? You're still going to have flow through those two transistors, right? So you're going to be dissipating some sort of energy and there's going to be some sort of delay. So in order for it to go through the first one, you just have, it's the, bot, the capacity of the body of that first charge. Now the second transistor, it has the flow of the first, from the flow for the first transistor and the flow through the second transistor, and it has to be able to allow that to go through. So you have to worry about the dissipation through there. Same thing, we activate this transistor by putting it through a zero, right? Then we have to worry about all of the flow. Oh, come on. This is going to be a long day if this isn't going to work. Here we go. It goes through all three transistors. You have to worry about all three. One like this, right? It would have to go down to zero. We call that, it's the same thing, you know, the 5RC goes from, as it approaches unit one, same thing, if it approaches unit zero, it's the same thing. Does that make sense? All right, so. Try this again. I was acting slow for some reason. Okay, so uh, we also talked about, remember we talked in section two, we talked about this contact, concept of diffusion capacitance. And when we did stick diagrams in section one, I talked a lot about how when we got into more got into a more physical understanding of how this works, that you're going to do the stick diagrams in a specific way, and that there's a uh, specific reason that we're going to lay them out for, for right now. It just, you know, that push the I believe button for the time being. So this is where we talk more about why we're going to do stick diagrams in the specific ways that we do. So this diffusion capacitance is what happens when we share contacts, right? And when you're sharing contacts, so we have three potential transistors here, right? So this is representing a three input NAND gate, right? So whenever you have a distance here between a metal and the P diffusion, right? There's no distance here because there's actually metal going into it. But there's a distance here, which means if you're going to do that, you're going to get capacitances. So if you end up doing too many of these, your capacitance is going to skyrocket. So you're going to have, this is where the 2C comes into play because uh, you, you're going to have NMOS going through or PMOS. And you remember, I don't know why it's drawn this way in this diagram, uh, but normally the PMOS transistor is going to have two, you're going to, you have to have the ratio of two to one and as a result, you're actually going to have two pins up here. I don't know why the two pins are down here in the NMOS. This is a poorly designed circuit. Um, but it has, it's got to flow through all of these to go to the output, right? So this is where tying in your knowledge of stick diagrams and layouts comes into play, just like, like that question before. Because you have to go through all three of these in order to get a logic zero on the output. Whereas you can go through here, or you can go through here, or you can go through here to get to the output. So you only have to worry about one of these. So you have to worry about this diffusion capacitance. So here, example 93 shares out one diffusion contact, right? So now we're actually able to reduce these capacitance levels, right? 
Now the reason why is if we had three, it would be 2C, 2C, and we have a third 2C, right? So with good design, you can actually reduce this capacitance, which means we have less propagation delay, which means the circuit's going to switch faster. So in this case, we've actually reduced the output capacitance from 9C to 7C. You see? If we had a third metal one here that went in there and it could flow like that to the output, you would have a third, you, you would end up creating a third diffusion capacitance. So a good layout is minimizing this diffusion area. So instead of having a third one, we only have two, which reduces your output from 9C to 7C. So therefore you'd have 7C plus 5H because you still have the two and three there, right? So this is why un this, this is another example of why understanding design at different levels becomes important. So we're designing it at the gate level, which is which you know if you remember that Gatsky can chart, you've got polygons and sticks. We have sticks, then polygons, then gates. So here we're now we're dealing with sticks and how that ties into the polygons. So if we're just designing at the gate level you end up having to do that Elmore delay as we designed with our RC model. So you get 9 plus 5H or 9 plus 9, uh, 9RC on the output and 5RC on the input. But if you, you can actually optimize it with proper physical design. So at different levels. And so if you're using Verilog, Verilog codes down to the transistor level. So the Verilog, that's where you're dependent upon the synthesis tool. And so I want to ask you guys, this is a good uh, type question. Based on what I just said, which, you see these two NAND gates? These are logically identical, right? So in this case, if it was a two input NAND gate, you could go A to the output, or A to the output. Same thing, you can go B to the output, or B to the output. Both, in both cases, you have to go through A or B to get to zero on the output. So these are logically equivalent circuits. But based on our, our knowledge of physical delay, which one of these circuits is better? Why? Exactly. So here you would have, let's see if I, uh, it would actually draw out. So here, the gate is going to be 2C, right? And here you have 2C and 2C. So here, you've now cut it down. Because remember, we, we had this. We had 4, and it would be 2. So this would be 6C on the output for the 2 input NAND gate. So now, instead of 6C, we've now cut it down to 4C with good st stick level design. Does that make sense? And as you can see, you all got that right. Now, before I move on, because uh, I know this is a very complicated concept, does anybody not understand this? I'll happily discuss it again. So yeah, we've kind of we've uh, we've reduced the, the diffusion region. So that's why when I say that the ability that the capacitance is the ability of a body to hold the charge, what's going on here is we have what is in is, is in essence two plates, right? So here we have our body, and it's our the ability to hold a charge comes from can it how long can it keep it from going from a zero to a one, right? And so that contributes to our non-ideal switching. So we uh, we want it to be really fast, especially when we're you know we have computers that have 2.4 gigahertz. Maybe it's 2.4 times 10 to the nine cycles per second, which means we want that going really, really fast. So 
we've now improved the ability of this cell by instead of designing it this way to designing it this way it has the same area it accomplishes the same logic but switches instead of uh, four six, so six units it only takes four so we've cut it down by 33 percent just with a small little design consideration and if you recall if you look back I did the stick diagram this way and I think I do recall somebody I, I I forget who it was, but somebody asked me why we didn't do it like this, and I said to be to be determined later. This is why. So understanding this concept of Elmore delay and diffusion capacitance and explains all of this. So so here's a good combination type problem. So we have a two input NOR gate. So First thing I do is sketch a two input NOR gate with transistor widths chosen to achieve effective rise and fall resistance equal to a unit inverter. So what I what that is that means is use that algorithm that I gave you last lecture to determine the appropriate widths. So here you first thing you do draw out your NOR gate. And remember it's two times the number of PMOS transistors that you have to go through and one times the number of NMOS transistors you have to go through on a specific path. So in this case, two times two, so there are going to be four, right? And here it's going to be one. So we can guesstimate that our output for one and one, and we correctly guess it's going to be 6C. We know we get rid of a lot of these because they don't contribute to the logical switching. Right? Because there's, this one's always tied to ground, I mean tied to VDD, so it's never going to switch. So you can compute the rising and fall propagation delay of the NOR gate driving H identical NOR gates using Elmore delay. So now we're building problems on top of problems and combining concepts. So this is a good combining con. Yeah, ah, spelling when it doesn't. It doesn't register all your letters, so it just makes it look like you suck at spelling. So assume that every so when you have this gate driving H identical NOR gates, then you want to account for your inputs here. You see what I'm doing over here? 4C plus 1C here. I'm doing this to calculate this input 5C. Specifically because I want to tie this to H identical NOR gates. So the reason why the question is phrased that way is because they want you to first calculate your output by doing this, right? So remember you have capacitance on your gate, your source, and your drain. And so when you have your gate, I mean, your source is going to be here in this case tied to VDD, so it's gone. It's always going to be tied to zero. It's always going to be tied to zero. But then on your drain, right? What is tied to what? Yeah, it's always tied to VDD. Yeah, so, to yeah, so remember, capacitance is ability to hold a charge, but it's going to dissipate, right? So the switching, to figure out rising and fall delay, is a, the, uh, the ability of the circuit to change. So if it's the, that source capacitance is always tied to the to VDD or to always tied to ground, that means it's never going to change. So it doesn't contribute to the transistor's ability to to change in the circuit. So that's why we have. Let's see, let me go back here. We tie this together. We're going to have four on the output here, right? Because that's kind of tying. It's a oh wow. It's, it's, yeah. Because remember we were, we were doing the NAND gate. And the major one that tied to on the uh, NMOS transistors was the one closest to the output. All, all the rest of them are tied to ground. That's why. But then your gate capacitances tie to the input because they're all inputs, right? So that problem, the previous problem was how much do we contribute to the output capacitance? 
And then when you ask about it's driving a number of other gates, in this case, it's driving H identical NOR gates. It means it's identical. That means it's going to be a two input NOR gate. So quick question. If this question was phrased as a three input NOR gate driving H identical three input NOR gates, what would be the output and input capacitances? So if we change this to three. Seven. So you have how many, tra how many PMOS transistors would it be going through? And so what does this become? Three times two, right? And then how many, so this would add in another one here, right? So if we have six here and three here, your output's going to become nine. And so your input, the reason why it's, so this is a good, this, uh, let me, okay, so let me ask you, what do you think the input capacitance is going to be now? George, you said the right answer there, seven. Why is it seven? Okay, so mathematically, Demba is correct. Why physically is it seven? Why are we defining it as the input capacitance? How many inputs does it have? Three, right? So if it's driving H identical NOR gates, the output can only drive one input at a time, right? So it's going to be tied to one input. It could, let's, so let's say it's tie, driving a NOR gate and it's driving another NOR gate. Each of those NOR gates is tied to one input. If for some reason it's tied to a second input, it's going to be another input that's tied to one PMOS and one NMOS transistor, right? So for each of those inputs, it's going to be adding that amount of capacitance. So that 7C that it's adding there, it's actually for one input. So the reason why they phrase the question in this manner, if it ever scrolls up, there we go. This particular thing, if you, those of you who've looked in the textbook, the, the problems are phrased that way, is because it wants you to understand about you're going to eventually tie this to another circuit. So this is a basic question. They're saying, okay, you have a, a cell where you're driving some number of identical cells. Do you understand that one input is being driven by your out, at least one input is being driven by your output at a time? And that each of those inputs that it's driving has a capacitance. And be, by multiplying it by H, the more cells that you tie to it, contributes to an increase in the propagation delay. So that's where scan map becomes an issue. Whatever you want to talk about scan map there is this course. Here you remember like electrical circuits and to a certain extent in advanced digital systems where you, you have one device but it's driving like six or seven. This becomes a major issue especially in bus design because of if in a bus so for example in MIPS you have a 32 bit data path, right? So that 32 bit every single wire in there has 32 bits of data unless it's you know the 16 to the uh, I mean okay you don't, you don't know what I'm saying like it could, it could so you have to have the signal propagate along each 32 each each of those 32 bits with the same uh, intensity and it has to go fast because buses are meant to be fast so you have an arithmetic logic unit calculate a value right and so on the last thing it goes through is a multiplexer so that multiplexer, each multiplexer is going to drive one line of that bus. And then you have to have some sort of timing circuit, especially in pipelining. In pipelining, you're going to have a buffer hold all those values. And then once the clock switches, it has to go through all of the buffers to tell the signal to move on to the next stage of the data path. So, that's where you have to worry a lot about this. Driving H identical NOR gates or 32 identical multiplexers or 32 identical buffers. Does that make sense? 
sorry, I'm, a, I'm attempting to emphasize a lot about combining concepts. So, uh, Demba didn't mean when, when you, you did mathematically answer it properly. But there's, there's something to when you're in job interviews, being able to say, here it is mathematically, but here's intuitively why as well. So when you take your exam, I want you to kind of emphasize both of that. I'm not going to necessarily, you know, what I want to see is connecting the dots. And specifically an attempt to connect the dots. When you're in a job interview, you're not necessarily going to get hammered if you don't successfully connect all of the dots. But what they want to see is not, okay, well, I know that if I plug this into this equation, then I will get this. That's great. I'm hiring you to be an engineer. Show me what else you, you know, show me it's a different level of thinking. So for here, so you, so you all correctly figure it out. 6C plus 5HC, because it's driving that. And so for rising, we're going to use our Elmore delay equation. It's going to go through R2 first, right? So in this case, you do worry about them because it's going because this is what's it's going through all it's going through all of them here. And then you have 6C plus 5HC on the output. So it's R over 2 plus R over 2 here. Because remember it's going to be you have to have this over k, right? And so here's what we're tying into. So this is here. If you design it so that you actually have the shared uh, diffusion capacitance, when we're talking about NOR gates, so it has to go through all of them, right? So if you have multiple instances where you, if you design it properly, where you have your VDD and then you have your metal one go here and then it comes out, right? And then you have your two transistors. If you design it in this, this way in which we discussed, do it. Well, guess what? This goes away. So as a result, instead of it being 8C over here, 4 and 8, it just, this one goes away and it becomes 4C. So you see why this works and why we're able to get rid of it and why it doesn't eventually contribute? Because if you design it properly, they disappear. And therefore you have fewer bodies that can hold a charge and therefore faster, faster uh, propagation delay. Now, when you have a pull-down network, that means you're going to zero. So you're going to have a zero driving all these gates. You're only going to go through one resistance. So same thing, you're neglecting it's not on the path. So it's going to go through the output. So you have 6C plus 5HC, right? No, so what's happening here is that, uh, so, here's what, so here's what's going on. So you have, you're going through two transistors up here in the PMOS, right? That's not on the problem. Right, so that's, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing and contrasting. So the way it's being designed is if this was a some sort of poorly designed circuit to get to the output, right? And then we can get rid of it by improving it. So then you have multiple diffusion capacitances. In this case, what's going on here is that you can you have to take some sort of path through through one transistor to the output. So here you can either do it like this, right? 
we it was this it's the same it's the opposite concept of what we had the NAND gate or it can go through like that right so in this case you have 1c and then you have 1c over here as opposed to 1c over here So then what happens is you're just adding the outputs. This 1C has already contributed to this result, right? To the 6C here. So as a result, it goes on the output. So the per so there's the uh, to tie everything together, why is this such a good question? So it makes you understand why, how do propagation delays work. You're tying the concept of resistance beyond just a, being able to look at a resistor chart and say, okay, well, this is an ohm and this is, you know, this is what I hook it up and I have a total voltmeter, I have some sort of current. Well, resistance isn't just resistors, right? It ties everything down to the physical level. So you start down at that physical level and you say, all right, well, I have a body that either is positively or negatively doped. And then I put a, a chart, I put a value on the gate. So I have to create some sort of uh, diffuse, uh, inversion region. In order to create that inversion region, I have to have some sort of threshold voltage where it reaches. In order to reach that threshold voltage, I have to overcome some sort of res, uh, delay, right? So the time it takes me to reach that threshold voltage is this rising and falling time. So that's your non-ideal situation. So what's going to happen is, as I put together this gate source drain silicon dioxide in between and being able to have a body, all of these are going to have some sort of capacitance between them. And we want to minimize that. So if I tie my, by designing the circuit in a pull-up and pull-down network, by tying all of the uh, gate, I'm sorry, the uh, sources, to VDD or to ground or as many as possible, you're actually, that's always going to be a one or a zero. So the flow is just creating that difference in source drain, right? So you want to try to get that source drain voltage down to uh, zero. And remember what happens when you don't, that's going to create different, uh, I mean, we, that's going to create a different threshold voltage. So you have to design the circuits in a certain way. And so what's going to end up happening is if you design the circuits in a certain way and you account for these diffusion capacitances, it allows you to get that drain voltage as close to the source voltage as possible. Now, how do you do that? How much time is it going to take for this to happen? That's where you start accounting for Elmore delay because in certain cases, in, in, the, in the case of a uh, NOR gate, you have to go through multiple... N MOS transistors, right? Or only, but only one PMOS transistor to pull up. In the case of a NOR gate, you have to go through multiple PMOS transistors, but only one N MOS transistor to pull down. And then when you deal with other circuits, like remember we had that A plus B over C, uh, this was negated. So in that case, sometimes you have to go through multiple N MOS transistors or multiple PMOS transistors, and then you're tying those delays into the each path. So let's say you had two, one path had two PMOSs. So, so A, B, or C, you would have to go through two PMOSs and one NMOS, right? So that'd be four, four, plus two, right? So that's four and two is six, plus, then you have going to have two on a path and then a one on the other path for NMOS, right? So that's three, so that becomes nine on your output. And so your input capacitances depend on which input you're going to. If you're going to the A input, it's going to be 4 because it's going to be 2 and 2, right? But if it's only going to C, it's going to be 2 for the PMOS because it's only going through one path. So you have to know which paths you're going to. So it may seem like a complicated way of phrasing the question up here when it says, a, Compute the rising and falling propagation of a NOR gate driving H identical NOR gates using the Elmore delay model. But what they're actually trying to do is they're trying to make the problem simpler.
But by using the same steps, you could actually figure it out. Right, so if I, it could, you could have a type of question where a, a multiple stage question where I you could give you uh, not A, B, or C. First thing I could do is say, draw me your pull up and pull down network with PMOS. Then I could say, draw me your stick diagram. Then I could say, find, you know, find me the diffusion capacitance. And then find me, so if it's one of them's driving Find, figure, consider the A input if you're driving another A or B or C where you're driving the A input. And one, so instead of having eight, so let's say if I had, if I'm driving two devices, right? And I'm saying one of them where I'm driving the A input and the other where I'm driving the C input. So you know, we calculated our output is nine, right? And so we A is going to tie to a four, right? And it's going to tie to a two, and so is B, and the reason why is because they're always going to be on the same path, right? Well, actually, this is, hold on, let me make sure. So this is, it's going to go A, B, or C, but then it's going to go A, B, and C, right? So it's always going to go through this path. It's going to go through, it always has to go through C, but it can go through A or B on the pull-down network. So in this case, it's going to go through 2, 2, and 2. But in this case, if, we, if it goes through A or B, right, this is going to be 4 and 4, but C is going to be 2. So this will be 6, 4, I'm sorry, 6 and uh, 4. So these are going to, you see what I'm saying? I know the drawing didn't come out perfect, but what I'm trying to say is that A and B, the input capacitance would be six, and C, the input capacitance would be four because of the way it's on a path, right? Does that make sense? Yes, no? I know I'm throwing a lot of craziness out. But you see how that's different? Yeah, so your pull up is going to look like this. So if it's A, B, or C, right? So it would go for, so this would be, A and B or C, right? So that's our pull up network. All right, so let me actually work through this and make sure I'm doing the problem right. So here it's gonna, it, it's designed by the number of transistors it's gonna go through and it's gonna be two times this. So it's gonna be, uh, four, four, and four, because it's always got to go through two transistors. Does that make sense? Now the pull down network is going to be different. Pull down network, these are in parallel and uh, this is in series. So it would be A and then B would be here if it ever draws. So that's supposed to be an NMOS, and it only has a circle there. And then C is going to be in parallel, right? So for calculating this out, what's going to happen is the number of NMOS transistors becomes the capacitance. So this is going to be 2, that's going to be 2, and it's going to be 1. So your output capacitance depends on which transistors are tied to the output, right? So it's going to be 4 plus 2 plus 1 because they're all in parallel, so it's going to be 7 on your output. And so your inputs are going to be dependent upon which input you're considering. So let's say this is A and this is A, right? So your A is going to be 6. B is also going to be 6. But C is going to be 4 plus 1 is 5. Right? So, if I were saying that this device is driving two identical devices, one of them is on the A input, and one of them is on the C input, what's the total capacitance going to be? So we know the output is 7, so it's going to be 7. Now, in the, this question that we had here, it was driving H identical NOR gates, so we just said 5H, because we know that both 
uh, values are identical and happen to be 5. But in this case, one of, it's driving 1a and 1c. So I would say plus 6 plus 5. And that's all multiplied by C. So that'd be 13, 18 C. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Did that answer your question, George? So the other issue we're going to be dealing with is that in order to actually get this to go, we have to in, uh, deal with these concepts of linear delay, specifically effort delay and logical effort. So here we have this equation that we're going to be going over quite a bit in this course, D equals FP. So what does that actually mean? So we actually have to ca calculate the RC model delay. We know that's a linear function of the gate, but now we have to, we want to break it down a little further. So we've talked, we just talked a lot about fan out, right? So we have this parasitic delay, which we've already talked about, which is any delay, any capacitance that does not contribute to the switching. So anything that stops it from happening, you think of it as like a parasite, right? So it's parasitic delay. Now, we also have this effort delay, which we've kind of talked a, a lot about and we've alluded to. And we have this ratio of C out over C in. And that's going to contribute to electrical effort and logical effort. So we now know of a cell having input and output capacitances. The input capacitance is what's driving it, what it takes to be able to switch. And the output capacitance is the amount of effort it takes when you're driving something and other devices, right? So you have to worry about fan out. All of this contributes to how much the circuit can actually do. It's like any, it's like if you think of it as an algebra function, right? The algebra function, you, you know, y equals 9x plus 4, right? It's dependent upon the value of x as well as the amount that you multiply. So let's say the amount of fan out you have like fx plus 4. So fan out can contribute to that, and that would make it harder to rise your number, and well as the amount of input that you have. So the effort delay, effort, de effort delay, which pronounced correctly, is the delay that depends on the complexity and fan out of the gate. So f, so that, so you have our parasitic delay, and we have our effort delay. So effort delay actually has two port parts. So I noticed this, this feels like, yo, dog, I heard you like delay equations. So I will put a delay in equation in your delay equation so you can calculate delay like calculating delay. But that's just the way the universe works. If you don't like it, you can move to a different universe. Um, so the electrical effort is kind of what I've been alluding to in terms of this output and input, right? So it's just the ratio of C out over C in. So we calculated that cell had an input at uh, we had that that 18 C on the output, and so we have that just that ratio to output to input, and that just became three, right? And the other thing we have to worry about is this logical effort. So here we define it as the ratio of the input capacitance of a gate to the input capacitance of an inverter delivering the same output current. So the inverter serves as the unit of measurement. So that's why the original equation was let's do an inverter, then let's do a two input NAND gate, then let's do a three input NAND gate. So it's been building towards this concept of logical effort. So we have two ratios that tie into this value of F. So you multiply these two ratios together. So you have output to input capacitance and then input capacitance. So remember, units will set you free, right? So you have output to input. And that, that we multiply that by input 
of the gate to the input of a unit inverter, right? So then these are going to cancel out. These are all capacitances. You see how that works? So eventually it's going to become the output capacitance over the input capacitance of a unit inverter. But in order to calculate this, you actually need to know all of these like we we're doing with the Elmore delay. And then you add your parasitic capacitance and then you're able to get your total delay. So you worry about the output capacitance. How is your cell tied to other cells in the circuit? And then you have to worry about what's driving it. And then you worry about the internal parasitic capacitances. And that ties into all of your, how long it takes for a signal for, for you to put, put a value on the gate and be able to get whatever's tied on the source to be to show up on the drain. And I get to do a uh, shameless plug here as I shameless name dropping opportunity. Uh, this is Ivan Sutherland. He is currently a professor at uh, Portland State. He is also the inventor of, uh, so he's the guy who came up with the idea of logical effort. Uh, does anybody else know what else Ivan Sutherland did? Are any of you familiar with the scratch pad? If you go uh, YouTube, oh, even older than that. So, scratch pad. So uh, I can even go. Come on, you know you want to. So. This is basically the first uh, once we get past the sprint ad. So basically sprint which says fifty percent allegedly. We can save two hundred dollars allegedly. Limited time, which is probably already past. Okay, so computer sketch pad. Basically, this guy invented modern uh, ways of interacting. Let's see if I can so this is him. And you can actually put some magnet there and it's actually showing here. So he's actually able to write on the screen. So the guy who came up with logical effort was also basically the guy who said, instead of computers just representing ones and zeros and we interpret it, why don't we actually be able to interact with it? You know, anything that I do here where I'm drawing on the screen or being able to interact with the screen in any way, shape, or form, or being able to interact and see what he's doing here. This is he is the guy who invented it in the 1950s. So he won a Turing Award for doing this. And the, what he ended up using it for is being able to do geometric calculations. I think maybe on this diagram he also has like a lot of uh, schools will use this. Well, they'll put a, a drawing of a bridge and can use it to represent forces. So he actually had that going all in there. So he also was doing stuff with you know. CMOS design. And so that was him a long time ago. And that was him in 2012 when I got to meet him. And for those of you who've taken my 3D5 class, this is uh, David Patterson, the guy who invented MIPS. That's the gentleman who got to torture you guys with uh, all the reduced instruction set computers. So um, uh, knowing what Scratchpad is is actually pretty cool. It's knowing the, the history. For those of you, no, well, none of you had 385 with me last, last semester, but I went into a lot about uh, Dennis Ritchie and the invention of C and how that came over BCPL and well, George was the TA. So one out of 11 of you ain't bad, but um, that's a good opportunity. So grads, oh, George, uh, Vina, there's your, describe the operation of the sketch pad. That was probably, I just showed that. So, um, the unit inverter, if you recall this problem, we came up with 6RC, right? And we did this problem. We had 2 and 1, and we tied the units together and added them all up. 
right? So we had a buffer here that we were tying it to. And so we had this three input, three C input capacitance for the logical effort because we have two and one here. So scroll, scroll, scroll. OK, so find the logical effort of a two input NAND gate, right? So we go through the same steps, we draw it out, like so. And since it goes through two, it only goes through one here for PMOS, it's two. It goes through two N MOSs, it's two as well, right? And so now we have an input of two and an input of two here, right? So the definition of logical effort is that, do you lose it? Yeah. Um, Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. I just, I, hopefully, I was, I was like, maybe if I mess with it, it'll show back up, and it did. So, um, so we have the input capacitance of two here, right? See these two here? So, if logical effort is defined as the ratio of the input capacitance of a gate to the input capacitance of a unit inverter. So, in the pre, so pre, we define the unit input as 3C because it went through two and one. So here we add two and two, we get four. <coughs> so we just do four C over three C and just becomes four thirds. So that is logical effort. So at this point, now that you've had a lot of experience, you know, this kind of becomes a you know. This, the whole goal was, okay, we can get rid of these diffusion of capacitances by tying the VDD and intelligent design of our stick diagrams. So then we have your output capacitances and your input capacitances. So this would be 6C on the output and 4C on the input, right? And this becomes 6C plus H or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it'd be 4H. So, from example 3.3, three, if you do this for a 3 input, right? If we did a 3 input NAND gate, it would be 5 threes. And then we also can, if you think about it this way, right? So, each one of these is 2C, right? And then each, as you add the input, it's going to add another one, right? Every time. So this is just a 2C, it would be 3C. If it was a 4 input NAND gate, it would be 4, and so on. So you see how it keeps adding by 1? So the logical effort of an N input NAND gate is going to be 4 plus the number of inputs. Well, we already have two inputs here, so it's going to be 2 plus I over 3. So this would be 4, as we see with a 3 input NAND gate, it becomes 5, and so forth. And so by doing these problems, there's going to be a table that we're going to show here in a minute that actually has NAND gates and NOR gates and all these different things. So you see 5C, so this is the logical effort that we just derived. And then I did the same thing here where it's N for NOR gates. So what happens? We have for each PMOS, right? It's two times the number of them. So for a two input, it's going to be four plus one, right? So for if you have three, it's going to be six plus one. If you have a four input, it's going to be eight plus one because it only goes through one NMOS, right? And it's all going to be over 3 because 3 is the unit input of an inverter. So for multiple input input NOR gates, it becomes 2n plus 1 over 3. So the, so the uh, example question says, what's the logical effort of a 2 input NAND gate? So if I gave you a 9 input NAND gate, well, that's just 9 plus 2 over 3. If I give you a 9 input NOR gate, it's 
9 times 2 is 18 plus 1 is 19 over 3. So in this case, now that we understand logical effort and how that ties into delay, what do you think is more likely to be used, uh, ands or ors in circuit design? Yeah. Man, very good. For multiple reasons. Logical effort and remember we have the uh, ratio of uh, PMOS that's going to be larger than NMOS, right? So if you have in, in this similar area, but it's gonna ha it has to go through this way instead of only going through one. So as a result, you're going to have a very large pull-up network that you have to go through. So you're going to find that NAND gates are highly preferred to NOR gates in circuit design. And so this table here, basically I'm giving you how do you actually calculate the delay. So 3.14, logical effort of common gates. So 1, 2, 3, and 4, 4 inputs. And this becomes your gate for multiplexers. It's always going to be 2. And you're not really going to go past 4 input XOR gates, right? So those are your four values. So we've proven all of these, and the parasitic delay are given. They're based on uh, unit comparisons to an inverter as well. Uh, the NAND gate is just, and the NOR gates are both equal to the number of inputs compared to inverter. For multiplexers, it's going to be two times the number of inputs. And for XORs, again, it's you're only going to have the uh, four, six, and eight. Let me ask now. Let me ask you a question. I think because I think you guys have enough now to be able to answer this. Why would we define XOR and XNOR like this? What do you think? Why do you think there's different numbers? Think back to that example I just gave you about A, B, or C. What, was what do we have to worry about when uh, dealing with logical effort and delay with uh, the A input versus the C input? What was different about them? They weren't all ended. Exactly. So the result is that you had different capacitances. So here, these different inputs have different logical efforts because the ratio of the input logic to an inverter is different. So that's why that is the way that it is. Now, if you don't, if you don't mind, I'm going to scroll down for a split second. OK, so we'll do this problem, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. So I'll let you guys copy this down, and then we'll do the 3.7 example question, and then that'll be. So the exam will go through logical effort. Let me see what's after 3.7. Yeah, 3.7 and 3.8, but essentially the same problem. We'll go through All right, so I'm going to go past 3.14 and go to the example here. So estimate the stage delay of a fan out of four inverter. So what that means, and you're, you'll see this again, FO4, is you have one inverter driving four inverters here. 
So since they're both inverters, the logical effort is just 3 divided by 3, so that's 1, because the ratio of inverter to inverter is just itself. The electrical effort, you have 1 on each one, right? 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 divided by 1. And you use 3.14, you have your input here. So you have four inputs here, divided by one, because it's only just one, right? So that becomes four. The parasitic delay is given in 3.15 as one. And so our stage delay is just, the delay is equal to the parasitic delay whatever is P plus F, which becomes P plus G times H. So it's 4 times 1. So it's 4 times 1 here. Plus the parasitic delay, which is given in the table, is 1. So that just becomes 5. Right? Pretty straightforward. So if this was give, estimate the stage delay of a fan out of H inverter, then this 4 would just become H. So this should become H times 1 plus 1. So this would be 1 plus H, so it would just be H plus 1. So I'm going to scroll past 3.15 and get to this 3.8 here. And this is, oh, sorry. We'll do logical efforts of paths starting next lecture, and that'll be uh, where the next exam starts. So a ring oscillator is constructed from an odd number of inverters. So the way this works is if you had an equal number of inverters, there should be a buffer. You put a signal in there, and based on the delay of the inverters, you get a change signal. So the logical effort of the inverter is 1. So you're going to have n. It's going to be an odd number, right? Additionally, the electrical effort of inverter is 1. Therefore, the stage of each delay is just going to be 1 times 1 plus 1 over, which is going to be 2, right? So for n stages, so each stage is going to be a delay of 2. For n stages, it's going to be 2n, right? So in order to change twice, the period must be 2 times 2n, right? And the reason we need to change twice, so we're trying to estimate the frequency. And so the frequency is I change, and I change again. So that's why it's an oscillator. So that's the time period to get from here to here is 4n. And the frequency is 1 over the period. It's going to be 1 over 4n. So to solve this problem, the first thing you do, you, you figure out the delay of one inverter. Then you figure out, okay, well, I have n of them. So it's going to be 1 plus 1 times 1. So it becomes 2. I have n of them, it becomes 2n. I need to switch it twice to be able to get my time period. So that becomes 4n. And then frequency is 1 over the time period, which becomes 1 over 4n. So if I had five inverters, it would be 1 over 20 times the unit delay. So let me uh, delete all that writing. So does anybody have any questions on this? All right, well, on that note,